Right, as you know, I'm talking about a psychological approach towards character development. Um, and I'm going to be talking about um, really some of the things that I cover, some of the things that I teach, uh, that I touch on today. So first of all, what is a psychological approach towards character development? Well, so that's obviously an approach informed by psychological theory and research. And while I consider it to be character first, it isn't necessarily just that. I also think about um, the audience's perspective, the reader's perspective, and their relationship to characters, emotional engagement, tension, and so on. And um, at present, I'm completely agnostic about uh, structural forms. There's nothing, there is no kind of really strong psychological theory that suggests that any of those um, received wisdoms about three act structure are, are necessary. So why do I take a psychological approach towards character development? Well, first of all, um, it provides arguably valid and robust tools, um, not robust tools necessarily for character development, but we know that within psychology as understanding people that these are valid and robust, these theories and methods. So it would seem to make sense that given that we're trying to generally create lifelike characters, we don't obviously have to create lifelike characters and realistic characters, but it would make sense that when we are attempting to do that, that these tools would likely be useful. Um, it addresses the problem of reliance on outdated psychological ideas and pop psychology that still permeates some teaching um, of screenwriting. And um, it also provides solutions, I think, to very vague development notes. So one of the reasons why I started getting interested in psychological approaches, I had a uh, my, deg my degree, my first degree was in psychology, was that when I started teaching and then getting notes myself as a writer, first of all, I found that quite a lot of pop psychology was being taught. And I was pretty sure that there was more stuff from psychology that could be very useful. And then second, secondly, um, whilst I've had great notes potentially on structural improvements that could be made on some of my screenplays from some really good editors when it came to character development um i was quite frustrated that how vague those were and also myself as a as a teacher uh, um, and script editor it didn't feel enough and very useful to be able to say simply you know, make your characters more complex make your character more memorable make their relationships more compelling make us care what does that actually mean? And for you know, students first starting out, those are quite complicated things to understand and have any idea of how you approach and solve those problems. So I thought I, I'm pretty sure that there'll be more useful, um, precise, and concrete tools from psychology that could allow um, you know writers to 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 work with. So some kind of toolbox or framework. So um, I think these approaches are very useful in thinking about how to solve some of the most common character development problems that I come across with student writers. Um, and I should also say that I work in the industry as well as a script editor. Um, so professional writers as well. Uh, of course, you know, the, the first note is that their characters are thin, they lack complexity, they may not be believable, hugely problematically, they may be unengaging, not memorable. Their relationships may be un completely uninteresting and they lack convincing character transformations when the intention is that they transform. So these are some of the things that I've been considering as well when using these, these approaches and these tools. Um, so thinking about developing a character, most writers and also novelists report that character development takes time. And it seems, we don't know much about that, but it seems that that generally begins with consciously outlining a character and drawing an observation. So uh, um, a method where we're thinking, I suppose, quite logically about what that character needs to be, what they need to do. We have no, we're not internalizing that character at that very first point. And then for most writers, or at least we know that at least 60% of published novelists in one particular study, um, uh, they begin to internalize this voice. So the longer that they think about this character and the longer that they workshop their character, it appears that they internalize the voice that they've sort of started to be logically thinking about. 
and start to hear them as we would with they hear that voice in their head, just as we would with um, people that we meet. We start to hear their voices in our head. We imagine conversations with them and we start to imagine what they would say back. Um, and interestingly, studies on actors suggest that the MRI suggests that we suppress our own voice when we're in character. So we start to hear these other voices that we've internalized. Um, and as I was just beginning to mention, we know from one study, there aren't many studies in this and, and there aren't any, as far as I know, in relation to screenwriters, but 60% of published novelists um, hear their character's voice in their head and also experience them as having their own agency when they start to write. So they start to do things that, you know, take them off the page, take them away from that outline. I think that's really interesting. Obviously, it'd be fascinating to know what happens with the other 40 percent of novelists. How do they work? And also, uh, you know, is it that the better writers are internalizing those voices and that's the way they operate? Is there any difference in relation to the art that they produce? Um, but it'd be, you know, I think really fascinating to dig down deeper into those stats and, and understand that process better. So moving on, my approach, um, I very pragmatic. So I completely acknowledge that writers start their development in very different ways. Some may come, some are more interested in story and plot. Some may come with a theme or controlling idea. Um, others start with a character first approach and others may just have a scene or an image in mind and be, you know, kicking things off that way but of course all of you know we can start with any of these approaches and actually they come together quite well so I don't think it's a problem if people come with any of these ideas we can easily move between story and character theme and character uh, and, and develop a scene or an image and so on um so at the beginning of my um my approach I tend to stress that this isn't a process that I like to see rush too much. And I'm conscious that um, that can be really tricky in universities when you've potentially got to, you know, produce a feature script in a term. Um, I remember when I started, I did a, a um, when I transitioned into screenwriting, I took a two year program, uh, um, the advanced and uh, uh, um, professional programs through UCLA. And we had to write feature scripts in, I think 10 or 12 weeks and you would come to a new term and a couple of weeks into that process you would be straight into script script pages so there was really very little time to have any idea about what your characters were going to be like you just had to write and you know that's potentially a it's fine it's a process but you'll be discovering your characters as you write and clearly that's one way to go um I tend to, I also work with, uh, uh, on, in development labs and um, teach in the industry as well, and then tend to spend much longer on the character development before um, I encourage students to, you know, really start writing the script. And so what do I do at the beginning? First of all, I get students or writers to note down anything that they know about their character. So what are their first ideas? That they may have a few ideas about character traits. They may have ideas about the character's motivations, beliefs, flaw, backstory, whatever it is that's there, just make a note of it. Um, I'm going to look at all of these in a moment in a little bit more detail. I then suggest that they cast that character using images. We'll look at that in a moment. Consider how they intend their audience to feel about their character, develop traits, character flaw and goal. So um, typically I'll start off in any workshops I run with an exercise, something like this. So they'll think about the central character they're currently developing. And I'll just ask those writers um, to jot down 10 adjectives describing um, psychological traits of that character. And then when they've done that, I ask them to group together any similar adjectives and have a think about how many groups they've got. So I don't give them any firm rules about how to do that. What I say is that, you know, it's quite likely that some of those adjectives will feel as though they'll fit together, like outgoing and chatty, just feel as though they go together. And typically the writers come up with somewhere between two and six groups there. Most are three, four, five and so on. So I explained this is a really useful starting point because it could be that if they have 
less than five groups there that it may be that that's because um, a dimension of their character's personality is missing. Um, or it could be that they haven't had enough time to perform this exercise or I haven't given them any good rules about the groupings. But it can be a useful starting point to get them thinking. And then I go on to explain the big five dimensions of personality, um, which are extroversion versus introversion, agreeableness versus disagreeableness, neuroticism versus emotional stability, conscientiousness versus lack of conscientiousness, openness to experience versus being closed to experience. And these are all independent. Um, so the degree to which anybody is more extroverted or introverted has no bearing at all on the degree to which they're more agreeable or disagreeable. And these are all spectrums. So all people and arguably all characters can fit on a spectrum of being somewhere between highly extroverted and highly introverted. Um, and I usually talk through the fact that this comes from um, the idea that uh, um, uh, if we are to fully understand somebody's character, then, um, or personality in full, what personality in full can incorporate, we would need to think about every word in the English language that potentially could be used to describe somebody else. So um, everything, every trait that we notice in somebody, um, we will have a word for. If it's something that we notice, we'll have a word for it. But it's very likely that to capture personality in full, we don't need all of these words. Some of these are gonna be synonyms, but also more than that, it's quite likely that actually there may be personality types that where uh, these traits, these words, these ad adjectives tend to cluster together. So, um, so early psychologists using the process of factor analysis, so Toops and Kristall were the first people to identify the big five dimensions of personality, found that there are these five um, independent factors and that in full we can completely capture personality by understanding people um, on these five factors, these five dimensions. So uh, Tips and Crystal in 1961 found that personality can be described by these five dimensions and that these are really very powerful. They predict the way we behave, relate to others, the way we experience the world emotionally, our motivations, our beliefs about the world, and even the way that we speak. So personality can be considered through this approach to be very much at the core of character. And I find this really useful because um, when I'm running through this in workshops, I'm going to dig down a little bit deeper into these dimensions in a moment. But when I'm running through these in workshops, um, many of the writers will say, well, I, you know, I very quickly answered uh, your questions for the first three dimensions, but I'd never thought about some of these last dimensions. So it gets writers thinking, you know, very early on before they start their script, um, what may what may be missing and how can we understand what is character complexity? How can we better define actually roundedness of character? We talk about roundedness of character. But that's very vague. Those definitions of roundedness are very vague. And this arguably is what roundedness means, capturing a character on those five dimensions. Um, OK, and then. Around this point, I also suggest that the writers find an image, find images actually, to represent their character. These don't have to be well-known actors. These could be, you know, images of non-actors they find on the internet. It doesn't have to be the same person. I ask them to find a series of images. And the reason that I do this is that we see um, at least three of these big five dimensions. We read them quite well in the face. So for some writers, you know, finding words to describe their, finding those adjectives, those personality traits to describe their characters may not be as easy, but they may respond much better to a, an image as a stimulus. Um, so I think this can be quite a useful prompt before um, the next exercise. And I also think it's interesting here, I've you know, I've taken images of a variety of different actors, but actually, if you look at them, I think, or the way that I perceive um, the personalities in their faces, there is something similar here. I'm getting the sense of a similar kind of uh, character or, or some traits that, are, you know, could be similar. So um, I think that this can be quite an interesting starting prompt uh, for development.
Um, and as I mentioned, that's because we read extroversion versus introversion very well from a static neutral face with even just the hair pulled back, neutral headshot, we can read introversion versus extroversion from it. We can also read agreeableness versus disagreeableness pretty well from a static face um, and neuroticism versus emotional stability. And then other studies have suggested maybe conscientiousness, maybe some openness to experience as well. Um, but to a lesser degree. So that face is a good prompt. Um, so when I've asked the writers to, um, you know, find their image, I then normally embark on uh, um, a little exercise where we get them to think about a little bit deeper about these five factors and, and their, their characters. So starting with extroversion versus introversion, I normally talk about this first because this is really one of the first things that we notice in people when we meet them. Extroverts are um, very outward facing. They um, they gain energy from interacting with other with, with other people, having social relationships, uh, um, you know, being out there in the world. They tend to be upbeat and positive and and thrive and they're playful and and they're excitement seekers versus introverts need quiet time, they need downtime, they're much more inward looking. Um, they tend to be more serious and more passive. So digging deeper into those facets associated with extroversion, extroverts tend to be warmer, more gregarious, more assertive, more active, uh, more prone and, and enjoy excitement seeking, and have more positive or upbeat emotions. And introverts will have typically have the opposite. So they'll be cooler, more antisocial, more uh, um, submissive, more passive, avoid excitement and have more neutral or serious emotions. But these, all of these traits that cluster together under extroversion are again spectrums, they're continuums. Um, so I then point out that um, while these traits often fall together, while they often cluster together and an extrovert may have all of those traits, actually it can be interesting and many characters are high in some of these traits and lower in others. When I say higher, I mean higher um, on the spectrum, uh, so closer to extroversion on some of these traits and more introverted on other traits. So the Bond character is generally portrayed as being more assertive, active, is certainly an excitement seeker and has more neutral emotions. And I've left out these two top traits, these two top dimensions, warmth and gregariousness, because he's more neutral. So when a character is more um, in the middle of a, uh, the spectrum on one of these traits, we don't really notice it. We don't have words for characters that are neither warm nor cold. We have words, those personality traits, when character went for, for uh, for when when characters show that strongly. So um, when I then get actors to, sorry, not when I get the, the writers to think about their characters on each of these dimensions, I point out that um, there will be some traits in each of these dimensions that they show most strongly. And those are the ones that we're going to read or register. Those are the ones we'll have words for. When they don't show us traits strongly, when they're relatively neutral, we don't notice it. So for most of these dimensions, it, it could be good to pick, you know, a few traits that they show most strongly. They may just have one or two, but it's likely they'll have a few on each of these dimensions they'll show most strongly. Um, and that also, the while well, these traits, as I said before, they cluster together, um, we can have characters that are a mixture of, you know, introvert, have introverted traits and extroverted traits. So this applies to all of the dimensions and all of the the facets or subtraits that are part of those uh, dimensions. And then having explained that, I then usually take my writers through um, a workshop where they think about each of these traits in relation to their characters. So I'm just gonna go through a couple of these, otherwise we'll be here for hours. Um, so beginning with warmth, I would ask them, you know, is your character generally warm towards other people and do they find it easy to make friends? So this is obviously closer to, this is on the extroverted side of the spectrum. Or on the other hand, are they more formal, reserved or aloof with others? Are they colder? Because we can create really interesting characters at either side of those spectrums. So I go through each of those traits in turn as a as a, just an initial workshop 
um, as the writers are starting to develop their characters. We move on to agreeableness versus disagreeableness. And this is um, interesting to think about because it describes the quality of your character's relationships with others, obviously hugely important. And while some characters are more agreeable, um, they uh, and, and are generally more liked by others, they're the kind of people who care about everybody else in the room, who are uh, um, very selfless, caring, kind, um, and so on. Other characters are hugely disagreeable and antagonistic with others. So the traits associated with that are with uh, agreeableness are being trusting, straightforward, altruistic, compliant, modest, and tender-minded, while the antagonistic um, disagreeable traits are being suspicious, um, devious, um, uh, selfish, um, competitive, arrogant, and callous. So stronger characters tend to be people that force their own way here. So we'll have at least some traits that are associated with disagreeableness. So it's antagonistic, but it also adds strength of character. So that's interesting. And of course, nobody's either completely agreeable or completely disagreeable. We often have characters that are a bit of a mix of both, which is interesting. So again, thinking about how these traits could be mixed up is also, uh, um, you know, can be just interesting revealing. Next, I mentioned neuroticism versus emotional stability. Um, another hugely useful one to think about. Some writers don't consider this start, starting out. And um, this, of course, captures the way that people experience the world emotionally. And while some people you know, feel the world more deeply, and I always point out that writers are much more likely to be on that end of the spectrum, they generally need to feel the world more deeply and, and be higher on neuroticism. Um, other people, other characters are higher on emotional stability. And this is an interesting one as well to think about in terms of um, genre. So um, characters that are full of their emotions, who are higher on neuroticisms, their emotions are going to draw attention to, you know, within themselves. So this tends to be a more inward journey. They're consumed by their emotions. They can't, they can't forget them. Um, so inwards journeys are, you know, hugely useful for dramas, whereas characters who don't have that uh, a very intense emotional experience um, you know, could be very well suited for action, adventure films and so on, where the focus is on the external obstacles and overcoming them. So facets of neuroticism are um, uh, having a tendency towards anxiety, anger, hostility, depression, being self-conscious, being impulsive, feeling vulnerable and um, emotional stability. Uh, uh, people are... Um, much more stable, um, calm and even mood, unlikely to feel uh, depression, feel very comfortable around strangers. Um, they are much more deliberate uh, um, and um, uh, um, uh, resilient. Okay. Moving on to conscientiousness versus unconscientiousness. This captures our sense of duty and our motivations. So while um, some people are highly conscientious, they are they feel competent, they feel like they can tackle whatever the world is going to throw at them. They tend to be organized. They tend to be very dutiful and responsible. They tend to be very goal driven. So that's something here I point out that I think is interesting because we're always talking about characters, protagonist goals, driving a story. Um, and of course, not everybody is high on achievement striving. Not everybody is very goal driven. That takes a certain type to be very goal driven. Um, and then we have the reluctant characters, the reluctant hero heroines um, who need to be forced on a venture. They, they're lower on achievement striving. So I think it's always useful to remind writers that uh, um, this is the, uh, uh, the trait that this is associated with. Um, conscientiousness is also associated with being self-disciplined and being more of a deliberate thinker and then unconscientiousness so so that can be all these all of these traits can obviously be very useful for genre films where you have a very you know kind of a driven protagonist other end of the spectrum we have unconscientious characters who feel incompetent 
disorganized or chaotic, irresponsible, um, just low on achievement striving, um, lack self-discipline, and they're much more spontaneous. So some of this lends itself to comedy, but also some of these traits as well can be interesting for, for dramas too. And then finally, um, openness to experience versus being closed to experience, another hugely interesting dimension. And one that I said before that many writers haven't necessarily thought about at all. So it may be one of the areas that, that isn't represented on those 10 adjectives that they've captured at the beginning. Um, uh, and this, people that are more open to experience uh, tend to be higher on uh, fantasies of their dreamers. Um, they tend to be interested in the arts and culture. Um, they tend to be open to feelings and, and have more emotional relationships with others. They tend to enjoy trying new things, trying new actions. They're open to ideas and open to others' values. So they actively go out in the world and enjoy debate, enjoy meeting people who are very different from them, um, getting into conversations with them, exploring ideas, um, and imagining how the world could be different. And, and this is moderately correlated with being politically liberal. Other end of the spectrum, we have people who are close to experience, who uh, um, tend to be much more grounded um, and interested in their day-to-day -day and, and, and often you know, more conservative, traditional, um, and may feel threatened or uninterested in strangers and people that are different from them. So they're lower on fantasy, uninterested in the arts and cultures, close to feelings, close to actions, close to ideas, close to values. Um, so having thought about that in relation to character roundedness, I then usually point out that um, all of these traits and dimensions fall um, in, this, in this bell curve. So, so most people aren't um, highly extroverted or low on extroversion. They're not highly gregarious or um, extremely antisocial, most people are somewhere in the middle. So if most people are somewhere in the middle, then you know these are the people that we're meeting every day. This is likely to be more like us. Um, and that means uh, more memorable people and characters that we see less often are going to be at the extremes of these spectrums and extremes of these traits. So if we're thinking about creating more memorable characters, we don't always want to do that. We sometimes may want to write a very average, typical character, whatever that is, um, and pair them, for example, with a psychopath. We may want to write a blander detective and pair them with a more memorable character. But if we're trying to write a more memorable character, then what we can take away from this is we need to give them more personality, give them stronger traits. Um, not on every dimension, not on e not on every one of those traits, but at least you know, you've got to give them some qualities. These are the qualities we'll remember. Will they be stronger? Okay, so having touched on that, I talk about, um, I, I normally get people to think about how your audience feels about your, or your readers feel about your character. And I get people to think about that at quite an early stage because otherwise I feel that if we haven't, if that's something we haven't thought about until the script is written and that it, it, you know, it's a lot of work to, to potentially redo. So I think that's quite a useful thing to think at a very early stage that you have to get your audience, your readers to care. Um, and this begins in thinking about their personality traits. So if you've just gone through this exercise, thinking about your character's personality traits, it can be useful then to switch into reader audience mode and, and think about how, how you would feel about that person. And then what's your intention as the writer um, to, to in, in terms of creating that feeling, how do you want your readers and your audience to feel? So do you want them to feel empathic to that empathic about that character? Do you want that character to be likable um, or intriguing? And then let's think about that in relation to character traits as well as the situation you're going to put them in. Um, and then also at this stage, I think it's really useful to think about um, the character flaw. So whether or not, however deeply you explore your character really, um, and I'm conscious that some structures and some journeys are very flaw driven and the, the, the redemptive story is often all about the character overcoming their flaw or potentially 
digging deeper and becoming more entrenched in their, their flaw. Um, but I still think that regardless of that, it's a very useful thing now to explore. It's not something that I wrote about in my book, but but since teaching, actually teaching more and working more with writers, this is something I'm stressing more and more. So then I, uh, you know, talk about obviously the inputs into character are going to be partly genetic and partly their backstory, their life experience. And, um, you know, particularly strong emotional experiences in their backstory will likely have created a flawed belief. So any particularly difficult experiences in a character's backstory um, will have resulted in them and in most of us um, developing some kind of coping mechanism that worked then, a flawed belief that was useful to hold on to then. So this is something that in many um, psychologists and psychotherapists work with, um, this flawed belief that may have started it may have started in childhood, but it may have started later in uh, um, adolescence or at any point really in a character's backstory. And it's a useful coping mechanism to allow that character, that person to deal with their world then. But actually in terms of long term, working long term, it, it's self-sabotaging. Um, and this, along with this flawed belief goes an emotional experience relating to that backstory so difficult emotions that that stay with that character relating to that 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 wound that they experienced and personality traits that are linked with it. So these three things can be thought of together, these flawed personality traits going together with a flawed belief and flawed emotions. And of course, at the same time as these flawed beliefs were developing as a result of that character's backstory, a character's goal would also potentially be being shaped. So if a character does have a particular goal, it's come from that same framework, that same life is experience that has created the flaw. Um, so I think this is something useful to think about and this helps us understand why we get that paradox around you know, the controlling idea, um, the, you know, the goal and the flaw being, um, uh, a, a paradox and working in opposition towards each other and then it's also of course a useful starting point to think about in relation to character transformation if your character transforms that while some characters will overcome their flaw others will become more entrenched in their flaw and and then and a third set of characters will simply resist any transformation at all so this can inform structure um Okay, then moving on into character developments, so that those are the beginnings. And then um, next stage is diving deeper into developing character voice and their behavior and, and their subtext, thinking more about that character transformation. Then of course, thinking about contrasting characters. Um, I typically use the big five, again, to think about um, how characters will have, you know, some things in common, and contrasting personalities and where we'll get most conflict, how that's interesting. And I, another approach I also use is the interpersonal circumplex, which I'm not gonna to touch on today. And then thinking about character relationships. Um, so um, digging deeper into character dialogue, if we think about it from the perspective of the big five, there's a lot that we can, I think, usefully teach actually. So while some writers are, um, I'm going to say some students are just uh, um, can be really, really good at hearing dialogue and getting it down. Other struggle, other students really struggle with this and often find it quite useful to um, have an approach of, you know, thinking about my character should be like this. I want them to be more of an extrovert. Therefore, here are some tips to do that. Here are some tools that I can work with um, to, you know, create a more extroverted character to, to understand in a more concrete way what how do we see extroversion or how do we hear it in the voice? Um, okay, and then thinking again more about behavior. So behavior of course doesn't just come from our personality traits, it's shaped by our personality traits. But I also po point out the importance of thinking about the context that a character's in. So who they're with in a particular scene, what's happening and also any emotional memories sparked. So 
you know, things start to become more complicated. We have a starting point as a character, but it's also then fascinating to think about how do these other factors change their behavior? Um, and then while we generally experience people as having consistent personalities, um, actually, you know, the personalities change slightly throughout our lives, but also according to the context we're in, actually some situations may push us to act out of character. And that's fascinating. That's one of the things that really, I think readers and audiences absolutely love seeing. It's, it's just a wonderful surprise if it makes sense, it's gotta be believable. So, you know, I talk about how we can create out of character behavior that um, feels believable given the circumstances um, to keep readers and audiences hooked. Um, okay, then of course, at this stage, we're thinking more deeply about character transformation and that from a psychological perspective means changes in a few key personality traits, the ones we've been looking at and motivations. Um, it may mean as well, uh, overcoming or becoming more entrenched in that flawed belief that we've looked at, overcoming the emotions linked with that wound that people have carried with them. Um, and then when we think about when people transform in real life, we know that the biggest transformations in real life happen as a result of emotionally intense life events, good and bad. So, you know, if you're charting that through your screenplay, we're gonna expect some bigger shifts after the dramatic events. This is a point, these are the points when we'll expect to see changes in personality, changes in motivations, changes in beliefs, but actually, um, there's also kind of micro transformation happening slowly all the time. So just a, a, a general gradual shift, we'd also expect to see across the screenplay in those traits and motivations. And we can also change as well when we are with somebody um, who is influential to us. And that's generally when their beliefs match our own lived experience. Um, that's a time when people can be you know, particularly impactful on our own lives. So it may be useful to think about in terms of ca our characters. Um, I also touch on, I know I'm through a lot now, but I just wanted to do a, a, a brief kind of, well, not a brief, a, just a, a, an overview of everything that I talk about. I talk about attachment theory. I think attachment theory can be very interesting um, in relation to thinking about character relationships. Um, I'm not gonna dig deep into any of these. I'm just, just gonna show you a slide that I'll bring up in a moment to think about this. Um, but I point out that while there are these, these four main styles of attachment um, that have come about as a result of, or are th theorized to have come about as a result of our early parenting in childhood. Um, actually, more recent evidence suggests that um, uh, our genetics and also um, the context and the person that we're with has a big impact on our, our current relationships styles as well. So just to take an example, um the anxious ambivalent attachment style um and i've got tanya from the white lotus here as an example um this is uh, theorized to happen when your parents are nurturing one moment and then unavailable the next um so this is you know with early infants the parents are there one moment unavailable the next and then what tends to happen as a result of this in in adult relationships is that people become very insecure very anxious needy jealous and crave intimacy. And, and Tanya from The White Lotus seems to be a very good example of this in a, in a television series. So I think it could be quite a useful guide to think about relationships, but obviously it's, I also explained that um, people aren't stuck in these styles and we can move on from these styles. And uh, it's also, as I said, context dependent, but I think it can be still quite a useful way of thinking about the different styles of relationships that characters can potentially have and why, because by this point, I would have already had my students explore their character's backstory. Um, okay, and then finally, we're nearly there. When it gets to the, the stage when they're writing the script, then um, I spend time, you know, just working with writers to make sure that 
their intended character is down on the page. So they've done a lot of theorizing about what they want in their character by this point, but are they getting them down? They'll have practiced lots of monologues to uh, develop character dialogue. And, and here my aim is with those first monologues that maybe they're using some of those tools, thinking about you know what can I pull from extroversion, the understanding of how extroverts speak differently to introverts or conscientious characters versus unconscientious characters. How can I use some of these tools consciously in 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 my character speech if I'm not hearing their character's voice but by the time that they've workshopped that character thought about them more written some more monologues um done some uh, hot seating we do some hot seating exercises as well then ideally hopefully they will start to internalize that voice and um you know be getting them down on the page when they're looking at other writers, when they're exchanging um, their pages with other writers in their group, then I will get them to reflect back to that other writer. How does that character come across? What traits do you read in these pages? What do what comes across to you? How do you feel about that character? And then we go back to the writer and ask whether that was their intention, so that they're you know starting to understand or think more about using these ideas in practice. Um, and um, so just back to that early screen where I talked about some of those common character development problems, we've looked at how to create, uh, how to sort of create more complex characters that are rounded by creating personality across those five dimensions, um, considering how context creates nuances and paradoxes and how people change when emotional memories are sparked thinking about um, believable, uh, you know, uh, how to uh, car make characters more believable by making them uh, um, consistent, but also uh, um, change according to the context and people they're with. Um, we've thought about how to make them more engaging by giving them uh, appealing traits that are likable or fascinating or, and or put them in sympathetic situations and how to make them more memorable. So hoping that these tools that I give writers go at least some way towards solving those character development problems. And then they, you know, they have that practical toolkit um, 